So we're looking at another passage in Allen, the first section of Allen Ginsberg's poem, Howl, and uh, I'll just read the line. Who were burned alive in their innocent flannel suits on Madison Avenue amid blasts of leaden verse and the tanked up clatter of the iron regiments of fashion and the nitroglycerine shrieks of the fairies of advertising and the mustard gas of sinister intelligent editors. And then I'll add this line, the rest of it, because I love it, but it's not quite relevant to the topic, or were run down by the drunken taxi cabs of absolute reality. All right, where's, what's the scene here? Burned alive in their flannel suits. What's the flannel suit reference? Anybody know it? Uh oh. The man in the gray flannel suit. The man suit. in the gray flannel suit, which is a sort of not very good novel, but it became a phrase. Vintage reference to what? Fans of Mad Men? An ad exec. The ad exec. Well, or any, any nine to fiver in you know, New York, Manhattan, flannel suit. The man in the gray flannel suit was a kind of a boring nine to fiver who commuted in. Yeah, so what's happening here? Why burned alive? What's Ginsburg saying about that life? And what are the, what's the leaden verse and the tanked up clatter? He's rejecting the nine to five and he's rejecting the, like the leaden verse could be that little pithy advertising statement that they make about buying toothpaste or shaving cream. Or... Could be. Anybody want to give an example of leaden verse that comes out of Mad Men? No, I don't mean the show, but Madison Avenue. Just sort of really clumsy, tacky, like copywriting. Not even clumsy, just very slick. I mean, I think of, um, oh, I hope this, this is a nonprofit kind of setting here, so I don't mind saying this, but you know, when I was growing up in the 60s, uh, Coke was called the real thing, and somebody would come on and say, Coke, it's the real thing. That's the kind of leaden verse that seems to be annoying him here, but uh, what else do we have to say about it? What does it have to do with the iron regiments of fashion? and? and uh, the mustard gas of sinister, intelligent editors. What kind of New York life is he rejecting here? Emery's. I think here we're finding the cause of death of the best minds of the generation we referred to in the first phrase. Um, this is what is smothering out all the individuality and intelligence and sense of freedom. Um, and it's autobiographical for Allen Ginsberg, who spent a little time trying to see if he could live a life in which he was a sort of low-level advertising, I guess a copywriter or some kind of low-level guy, in a madman, in training. I like the idea of burned alive. <clears throat> it's almost as if um, now burned alive, uh, there's something about flannel suits that made me think they'll, they're very flammable. <laughs> <laughs> but burned alive and then, and then arose phoenix-like as beat, as beatific. You almost have to burn your flannel suit to really get out of that. To get to out, of out of and it, and then to and then to and then to reemerge like a phoenix, burned and now released on the west coast, <sighs> right? Where else in, in a kind of you know in a kind of um, in a mental hospital, which is what's being written about in this poem, or in San Francisco, one of those two. And and it's true that Ginsburg went to his therapist at a certain point and said, and said, Doctor, I I, I just had to confess this, I. I, wa I don't want to have a job. I don't want to work a nine to five job. And it makes me feel ashamed because I'm an American. And, and I think I might want to, I think I might want to love men. And, I, and the, fortunately it was in San Francisco and the therapist said, so why not? And this leads to scribbling all night, rocking and rolling over lofty incantations. It doesn't lead to it because it's that line comes earlier, which in the yellow morning were stanzas of gibberish. Right? And so we have this kind of weird reversal, one, another reversal in how, where the, in, on Madison Avenue, they stay up all night as in Mad Men and they drink and they write and, and they leave in the middle of the night and what they've written seems like it's awful and they get in, sit there in the morning all clean and they realize it's brilliant that Cadillac is going to want to, to, to sign up with our agency because we wrote the For the Beats, it's the other way around. They spend all night writing and writing and writing and it makes such great sense and in the morning it stands as a gibberish and they decide that's what that's what we're going to publish that's that's good there's no place for them here in the advertising age um, an age in which poetry had become madison avenue slogans there's no place for them here except to be closeted and unhappy okay so let's look at another section um really just a line first of all before we do this there's this string of who clauses Right? So it's the best minds of my generation, and, and, and who, 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 who. How does that work? 
logically, structurally, grammatically, all these who clauses with long lines. Anybody? It's a little Whitmanian. It's uh, not just a little Whitmanian. <laughs> it's, it's a lot Whitmanian. There's repetition in long lines, okay? And it's kind of like, it's, it's building, using all the who's connects all these statements and it builds and builds and builds yeah. and builds. So it's a catalog, it's paratactic in that they're all equal, roughly. So it's very, it's, it's, it's participating in the Whitmanian uh, kind of capaciousness. Yep. And, um, but what does it do logically? Um, well, just going off what Anna was saying, it kind of serves as a consistent anchor to bring you back from where you started. So that every time you see who, it takes you back to the best minds of my generation. It's a poem about a generation, but it's wide enough and ample enough and Whitmanian enough to make sure it covers every sort of corner of this alienation, of this kind of counterculture. And this is one of them who threw potato salad at CCNY lectures on Dadism. Max, what, what, can you make sense of that? Well... There doesn't seem to be anything more Dadaist than to throw potato salad at a lecture on Dadaist. <laughs> well, let's and start with the... less Dadaist than having a lecture on Dadaism. Yeah, a lecture on Dadaism. I, I know that sounds obvious, but why don't we say what's... Dave, what is paradoxical or impossible? It's like preparing for spontaneous prose. It just doesn't make sense. <laughs> it doesn't, as a matter of fact. So here, this generation, Ginsburg and his pals, they go to a CCNY. They didn't go to CCNY. He and Kerouac were at Columbia. CCNY is what? Anybody know? The City College of New York. The City College, yeah, the City College. The City College of New York. <laughs> Fa famous, famous, inexpensive local urban college that a lot of intellectuals came through. It was a very lively place. Um, but by the time you get to the 50s, it's possible to have a lecture on Dada. And so he and his pals went. And what did they do? They threw potato salad. They threw potato salad, indicating that you cannot possibly have a lecture on Dadaism. And also indicating... This is what Dadaism is. You want Dada? I'll give you Dada. Do you know, I've, ta I've taught this uh, line many times, and years ago I was teaching a class to maybe 100 people in a big lecture hall. And I wasn't lecturing, but I, but I was still looked like a lecturer. And I used <laughs> to wear a jacket and tie. I wasn't wearing black t-shirts. And uh, a student came with potato salad and threw the potato salad at me. <laughs> was that and of course, moment? it was my proudest moment as a teacher. Everything else has been, been downhill. And don't you dare, don't you dare over lunch buy potato salad. All right, one last passage of this beloved poem, Howl, a poem that, you know, arguably really sort of solidified readers' sense of what the beat generation, what the beat writers were doing. Um, it's, the, it's one of the last ones. Let's look at it for a few minutes. To recreate the syntax and measure of poor human prose and stand before you speechless and intelligent and shaking with shame, rejected, yet confessing out the soul to conform to the rhythm of thought in his naked and endless head. Just let's start there. Let's take a little extra time and figure out what this means. This is really important. Molly, your first thought? Uh, it's a very vulnerable um, act mm -hmm. of, of creating poetry directly from what's in your head. What are the signs of vulnerability that you see? Uh, naked. Naked. Um, shaking with shame. Shaking with shame. This is a really big moment. Okay, thanks. That's a good start. Um, Anna, anything you want to add to this? Um, I think when we, where we have the, recreate the syntax and measure poor human prose and conform to the rhythm of thought, um, I think if you're thinking about the beats and sort of what this poem sort of is, recreating syntax, like conforming to the rhythm of thought, like that seems almost paradoxical. It seems counter to what we're actually doing, but it's really not because conform to the rhythm of thought, that's, it's doing exactly what Emily says in Brain Within Its Groove. You're supposed to be conforming to what your brain is just going to do. Do we have a do. synonym for conform in this context? Um, kind of just allow your brain to... Be in, its, like, you know, be in its groove and then be out of its groove. Okay. Make a new What's groove. a synonym for conform? Anybody? Constrain. Constrain. Constrain oneself, I guess. Okay, so this is rejecting yet confessing. What's this notion of, what is the theory of writing that's pre pre presented in this passage? Emery's? Um, what idea of writing do we have here? 
I think it's lack of self-censorship. A little bit mm -hmm. before when he says speechless, I don't think he means silent there. He means embracing incomprehensibility, rejecting Good. Um, normal discourse. Recreating the syntax of human prose. We're going to try, we're going it, to, this is a form of make it new. This is a resurgence. It's very, it's not a lot, it doesn't have a lot to do with modernism directly. It's more look, harking back to Whitmanianism and getting to a make it new thing through there. But it's, it shares the sense, sensibility of modernist manifestos in wanting to clear the space and start over. So recreating the syntax and measure of poor human prose and stand before you, who would you be? It's the first. You, the readers. You, yeah, the readers, speechless. I'm here, this is me, I'm on this page. Rejected yet confessing. Uh, Dave, you wanna deal with that paradox? Rejected yet confessing? Well, I think it's really autobiographical for how uh, outside of the mainstream Ginsburg felt. I mean, this is where it starts to get personal for Ginsburg, and he's just talking about his, his shame, his, his personal feelings of rejection. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want one more, somebody comment one more time on the implicit theory of the way writing happens. Well, if it's poor human prose, I mean, that could be kind of a move to recreate in poetry how people speak. Okay, that's instead, possible. Instead of, you know, Good. if we think about Wilbur's death of a toad, you know, he's not going up to someone and saying, and like, giving this fantastic metered elegy of the toad. He's saying, yo, today when I was mowing my lawn, I like crunched up a toad. Okay, so you're talking about so, the kind of uh, vocabulary language. I wanna, but I wanna focus on the last part of it. Rejected yet confessing out, out the soul. Rhythm, thought, naked, endless. Well, I think that kind of promotes the idea of not censoring yourself mm -hmm. while you're in the process so of writing. So writing happens how? Kerouac is going to have a lot to say about this. Writing happens how? It's unconscious. Where does it come from? From the thought. The gut the soul. The soul. From the gut, from the soul, from the, from the unconscious. It comes up and out. This is a, a theory of the way language works that's not going to be... The chapter 9 poets are not going to abide by this kind of naive theory of language. This is an almost theory of a fantasy of transparent language. That, that we... You, if you get hepped up enough, right, and if you have tapped into the best part of your mind, the part that the academy thinks is crazy, right, and you didn't get suppressed by social conformity, if you liberated the mind to go where it wants to go, you can write a language that doesn't get in the way, right? Freedom in writing derives from a feeling of being rejected, yet confessing out the soul, okay? Yet this is, this is not what critics have said beat writing is. They, it is not a call for total freedom. It is not a call for anything goes. It is not a call for pure spontaneity. It's a call for the language to conform to the rhythm of thought in the writer's naked and endless head. It is carefully wrought. And yet it abides by the theory that, that if you just do enough rejecting of social um, convention, you will discover something better. 